For this second video in the series, I'm back with my benchtop float factory, but this time I'm going to be concentrating on building the float dipping machine and putting it to use, and possibly making some floats. For the main body of the dipping machine, I'm using a piece of 3B1 planed all round timber. This is softwood and probably spruce and while I wouldn't want to make fine furniture from it, for this type of basic construction it should be fine. To help measure the first length I need I'm using a full extension draw slider. Closed this is 350mm long and has two sets of bearings to make sure it glides smoothly along its full length. If I leave about 3 inches and add the mirror ball motor I can make my first mark, but maybe not in the middle of a knot. Then mounted in the chop saw I can cut it to length. To make the sides I can use the front as a measure and add to the length the thickness of the timber, before cutting again. I can then mark the other side and also cut that to length. Before assembling the main components I can mark out some spacings for the screws I'll be using to join the pieces together. Although I could use glue I may want to make changes later as this is still a little in the development stage. With some clamps I can bring the sides and front together leaving space at the bottom. For fixings I'm using a braddle to start the holes and then to drill out a bit and countersink combined mounted in a handle. This should leave a clean finish with recesses for the screw heads. For the fixings themselves I'm using inch and a half eight chipboard screws tightened up with a cordless drill. Once both sides have been secured, I can slip the column onto its base, another short piece of 3B1. Using a square, I can bring it to 90 degrees and then fix it with some more chipboard screws. To prevent the column from tipping sideways, I'm using another short piece of timber at a right angle to the foot. This needs to be marked up for cutting a saddle joint and I can use the back of the foot to do this and then on the bandsaw remove the unwanted piece. After adding a couple of holes and screws I can slide it into position and fix it in place. Before fitting the drawer slide I need to remove the rubber latch. This would normally keep a drawer closed inside a cabinet. And also because I'm using the slider vertically I need to bend out one of the ends to trap the middle bearing race and prevent it from escaping. To fit the slider I can mark a centre line down the column with a pair of calipers. and then turning it over and extending it fully I can fix it with a couple of small screws. To mount the motor I've cut a piece of 5B1 softwood to the width of the column. This needs tapering slightly so the motor tilts back in use and winds the thread towards itself. To do that I'm going to mark a third of the thickness along one edge and then mount it in the bench vise. I can then shave down the taper with a hand plane until it meets the line. It can then also be fitted with a couple of wood screws.
and the motor with some smaller ones. To create the head that will carry the float, I can mark the width of the column on some more 3B1 and then cut two pieces to this length. These can be joined together to form a right angle with some more screws. For a little reinforcement I can mark out and cut another piece to sit between them. The angle can be added to this block and fixed with a screw from each side. To attach the head to the slider I'm going to drill out a couple of shallow holes to take some magnets. These are powerful rear earth magnets and they can be pushed into place and secured with some thin super glue which should be drawn into any gaps. Once the head is positioned centrally on the slider I can mark down one side. By adding some more super glue I can attach an off cut of parting bead. This will prevent the head from twisting on the magnets. When the glue is cured and the head has been refitted I can add some more glue to another bead and hold it snugly in position until the glue sets up. A couple of panel pins in each bead will make a more permanent fixing. To allow the head to accept the plates that hold the fishing floats and tips, I'm using some old picture frame to make a shelf, although a piece of one inch wood angle would do the same job. This can be cut to length and then pre-drilled with a fine bit, before being secured with some moulding pins. To finish the head, I can add a small screw eye to act as a guide for the thread. I also need to add one to the column at the side of the motor. To hold the thread I'm going to add a bolt to the column and to do this I'm going to clamp a piece of scrap timber behind where I need to drill to prevent the bit breaking out the wood. Once drilled this can be removed and a short 6mm carriage bolt added. And then the bobbin can be added with a washer fitted each side and a wing nut. The thread I'm using is 50 pound braided fishing line. I've wound this onto an empty cotton sewing bobbin using my hand crank blade. To thread the machine I can take the line up through the eye next to the motor and then back down and through the eye on the head before finally taking it up to the motor where I can tie it off using a uni knot. This gives me a simple pulley setup which means the line needs to be wound twice the distance the head moves effectively slowing it by half. I can tighten up the thread by winding the bobbin and then securing it with the nut. To make the plates that hold the floats I'm cutting down some strips of 3 8 plywood to the same depth as the head. These can be marked to fit loosely into the shelf and then cut to length. I've also cut some smaller 3x3 pads of 1 inch softwood and a couple of 2x2 pads of 3mm balsa wood. To deal with the balsa first, which will hold the float tips, I can mark a grid of lines with a gauge to give me 16 crossing points. I can drill out 16 holes using a bit slightly smaller than the diameter of the skewers the float tips are made from. With some super glue on the ply I can add the softwood pad and then with a bit more glue the balsa and also a weight for a bit of pressure while it all cures. For holding the finished floats while clear coating I can mark some more lines on a pad of the softwood spaced slightly further apart. 
with a fine drill of the same diameter I used to drill out the skewers in the last video. I can drill out the pad with 16 holes. To grip the floats while dipping, I need to add some short lengths of welding wire of the same diameter as the drill bit. These can simply be tapped into place on the pad, which I've already glued to the ply. To use the machine, I'm going to start with the tips, which have mounted in the bolster pad and then positioned in the shelf. To prep the machine for dipping, I've made sure the knot on the motor is pointing down. I can also move the head until it's near the bottom of the slider. Bringing the tin of paint alongside, I can adjust the bobbin until the tips look to be at depth and then tighten up. The paint I'm using is an acrylic undercoat that I've thinned slightly by adding about 10% water and then stirred. Turning on the power, will wind up the thread and once clear of the tin's rim I can position the paint underneath. To reverse this type of motor I can simply turn it off and on again and it usually changes direction although sometimes it does take a couple of goes. With the motor spindle turning at about one and a half rpm and the pulley halving that the machine gently lowers the tips into the paint. When the thread is fully unwound, it automatically begins to wind itself back up, pulling the tips from the paint. The slow speed of the head makes for a bubble-free, non-drip coat. When the tips are finally clear, I can remove the plate and put it somewhere warm to dry for an hour or so. For colour I'm using a fluorescent acrylic craft paint, thinned again with water and placed in a wide mouth tub. Before using I need to adjust the bobbin again to the new depth of the pot while making sure the knot is pointing down again. Then I can let the machine do the work. Depending on how smooth the tips are, some days I can get away with one coat of colour, but mostly they need two, with some drying time in between. When the thread is fully unwound, I can stop the motor and adjust the bobbin to get a more accurate depth of paint, and then let the machine pull them free. In the next video, I'll be finishing the floats, but while I'm showing the machine, I might as well cover clear coating the finished floats. I've used the holes in the bottom of the floats to mount them on the prongs of welding wire that are fixed to the plate. The procedure is almost the same as for the tips. I've set the knot to point down and moved the head back up the slider to account for the longer completed floats and finally adjusted the bobbin. Again I'm using an acrylic but this time a matte clear coat. To allow me to fully immerse the floats, I've simply cut the top off the deep bottle. I can seal this later with a plastic bag and a rubber band. With long floats, the dips can take a few minutes, but there's always another cup of tea. With this particular clear coat, I need about five dips, spaced a good six hours apart, to build up a nice layer. In the next video I'm going fishing with some flows and also I'll cover finishing them. If you've enjoyed this video and you'd like to support my channel please share this video to Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus or whatever social media you're addicted to. For feedback or to ask questions leave a comment below. To see more handmade fisherman videos follow the link to my channel or to be notified of future videos please subscribe and finally thanks for watching.